some methyl groups and a methine group. And you're really, even with a very high field NMR spectrometer, not going to be able to, to see a lot of distinction between these structures. But the big difference in mass spectrometry is that fragmentation will occur at points that give you secondary and tertiary carbocations more. So if we look, for example, on the next spectrum, on the spectrum of 4-methyl undecane, and now we look, we see a break in this usual pattern. In other words, the peak at 71 is enhanced, and the peak at 57 is diminished. And the other thing that's interesting is for all intents and purposes, you don't see the molecular ion. Or it's very, very small. And of course, the reason for this is now you've got two desirable breakpoints in the molecule where cleavage over here will give you a pentyl cation, a secondary pentyl carbocation. And that's going to be, give rise to your enhanced peak at 71. And conversely, there are fewer ways to break this mo molecule to give you a butyl carbocation because undecane had two positions you could break, whereas, uh, I'm sorry, dodecane had two positions you can break, whereas methyl undecane has one, so your peak at 57 is diminished. And if you look hard, you'll see your peak at 127 is also enhanced. Right here, you have this sort of downward curve. So a person with a mass spectrometry, uh, with, with mass, a mass spectrometer, could look at this molecule and say, this is 4-methyl undecane rather than, say, 5-methyl undecane. And this becomes important in marine natural products, where often you get lipid-type groups with unusual patterns, as well as in identifying lipid structures. Absolutely. Absolutely. St stabilization of the radical is less important than stabilization of a carbocation. Radicals are unhappy. Carbocations are really unhappy. Radicals have at least one electron in the vacant, what's essentially a p orbital, whereas carbocations have no electrons there. So they're much more unhappy, plus you have charge to stabilize. Other questions? At the 71 and 127 fragmentations with the metals migrate over to make the tertiary order? Abs um, I, would, I would imagine, yeah, I would imagine you probably, well, would the methyl, there's no simple migration. So if you look at a two pentenal cation, there's no simple migration that will give you rise. I guess what you'd need is, yeah, I don't, I don't know the answer to that. I know in cyclohexane, cyclohexyl carbocation chemistry, if you can get a 1,2 hydride shift that gives you a tertiary, yeah, it'll occur. If you can get a 1,2 alkyl shift, that'll give you a tertiary. So yeah, I'd say if you can find a 1,2 methyl shift, it'll probably, it will probably occur. But in this case, I don't think there's one occurring. And then by the time you go to a highly branched compound, so here's an example where you really do only have, have uh, you do see the tertiary peak predominating. So here's another isomer, highly branched isomer. And you'll notice the, the peak that predominates is absolutely that terc-butyl carbocation. And, and again, you don't, you don't see the uh, M plus. You don't see the molecular ion. So when you're looking at a spectrum like that, how do you know that there's a peak there? <laughs> great, great question. So the first thing that people often do is blow up the region where they suspect the molecular ion is. 
Now, the second thing is let's say you have a little bit of information. Remember the nitrogen rule that I mentioned? The fact that in the EI mass spectrum, if a compound has an odd number of nitrogens, if it has one nitrogen or three nitrogens or five nitrogens, the molecular weight is odd. And that's just the math of making up molecules. So in this spectrum, we were seeing peaks at 43, peaks at 57, et cetera. So if you know, oh, my molecule has no nitrogen, and then you see only odd peaks, you say, oh, wait a second, these all have to be fragments. So if you have some additional information, for example, you say, okay, no, my compound is a marine natural product that has no, no nitrogens in it, but I'm only seeing a peak at 171, in the EI mass spec, and remember, it's all reversed in the CI mass spec because you're putting on a proton, which add, adds one, then you'd say, okay, um, that can't be the molecular ion. And that's really important because otherwise you've gotten yourself stuck in this mindset saying, oh, this is the molecular ion. How do I get this, how do I get this structure? All right, I want to talk for a moment about alkenes and then move on to heteroatom compounds. So alkanes are the most non-intuitive because alkanes have no pl obvious place to take that odd electron out. We have to be thinking about sigma bonds or molecular orbitals. By the time we get to alkenes, we can say, OK, the highest occupied molecular orbital is a pi orbital. We'll kick an electron out. We'll get a radical cation. And we really can remind ourselves that there are going to be two resonance structures to it. And the chemistry of alkenes is very similar to the chemistry of alkanes, but now at least we sort of have a way of thinking about it. And we can think about things as a homolytic cleavage mechanism often to give an allylic carbocation. So let me just write sort of a generic compound. So imagine that we had an alkene over here, and now I've taken the alkene and I've generated the radical cation. I've generated the molecular ion. One of the very fundamental reactions of radicals is homolytic cleavage. Homolytic cleavage means you take this bond and you break it equally, homolytic. You take one electron, you send it one way. You take one electron, you send it the other way. So I'll draw my little fish hook curved arrows that you've been using hopefully since sophomore organic chemistry for this type of, for this type of re reaction. And I'll take away minus r prime dot so we don't see that because that's a radical. And this gives rise to an allylic cation. And so the whole series of peaks The whole series of peaks that you might see for an alkane, 43, 57, 61, you will see largely diminished by 2 for an alkene, 41, 55, et cetera, going up, going up the series. So in the case of alkanes, we were talking about Cn, H, 2n plus 1 plus here we're talking about Cn H2n minus 1 plus. Now the alkene tends, I'm not going to write it out as a mechanism, but you can write a curved arrow mechanism to walk your radical all over the molecule by a series of 1, 2 hydride shifts. And so the alkene tends not to stay put. So you can't, you might think, oh, I could tell where the alkene is in the molecule, but this migrates throughout the molecule. So you can't pinpoint where the alkene is. So let me just put up for comparison and contrast, let me put up one dodecene. 
That's on the flip side of your page. Thank you. And so for one dodecene, you see a peak at 41 by this new pathway, and ditto for 55, 50, for, um, for uh, 60, uh, 69, and so forth. And of course, you do still see the 43 peak, so you do also see the other pathway, as well as a 57 peak, and so forth. So the peak at, peak at 41, for example, is simply this cleavage mechanism I talked about. And I can at least, at least write it as 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. I can write it, there are two resonance structures, one with the primary positive charge and the other the major contributor with the secondary positive charge. But I can write a curved arrow mechanism showing the homolytic cleavage pathway. to give rise to the allylic carbocation. Oops. Thoughts or questions at this point? Um, what, what are the peaks with the circles on top of them? Peaks with the circles are other pathways that involve, for example, loss of a hydrogen atom. And so we're not, we're not talking about, we're not going to talk about every, absolutely every, every mechanism. So for example, this peak at 42, although some of it comes from the small amount of C13 isotopomer, also has to correspond to a species that is a radical cation with a formula of C6, C3H6, but we're not going to talk about the mechanism for formation. All right, I think at this point, what I'd like to do is to move on to heteroatom containing compounds. And what I think is neat about heteroatom containing compounds is we really can make sense of their chemistry from just a few mechanisms. And so in addition to the homolytic cleavage, we can also think of heterolytic cleavage mechanisms and hydrogen abstraction fragmentation. All right, so I'll write a generic heteroatom containing compound as Ry with showing a lone pair on Y. And I'm going to be generic enough that I mean that this could be an alcohol, an ether, a halide, an amine. But also the OR group of an ester. And so later on in the homework set, you'll get esters and we'll see mechanisms involving the carbonyl and also mechanisms involving the OR group. And we'll also say an amid NR2 group. All right, so the general gist is we can think of the molecular ion as kicking out one of the electrons from the lone pair. And so, for example, we can envision a homolytic cleavage mechanism, much as we envisioned the homolytic cleavage in the case of our alkenes, or our al, well, our alkenes. 
so we can envision a homolytic cleavage. And let me, let me enhance my molecule here. So I'm drawing in the alpha carbon, the carbon that's directly attached to the heteroatom, and the beta carbon, the carbon that's one over. And imagine a mechanism just like we saw before in the radical cation from the alkene, where the bond one over from the odd electron breaks, sending one electron to form a double bond, and the other electron to the other carbon. So in such a mechanism, will generate a radical, and of course the radical you won't see, and will also generate a species with a double bond to the Y group and a positive charge on the Y group that we'll see. The other mechanism we're going to see is a heterolytic cleavage. In a heterolytic cleavage mechanism, that means the two electrons go in one direction. Heterolytic cleavage, mixed cleavage. In other words, the electrons don't go one in one way, one in the other. They both go in the same way. And for simplicity, I'll just write our group like so. So here we are back at our, I won't need to write in write in the rest of the molecule. So you can think of the Y group, remember that's an oxygen or a nitrogen or something with a positive charge. You can think of it as a leaving group. And the leaving group takes its electrons and leaves, much as you've seen in regular carbocation, regular cation instead of radical cation chemistry, where in an SN1 type reaction or an E1 reaction, the first step is the leaving group leaves with its pair of electrons. And you get R plus, you get a carbocation. Now the other mechanism that can occur that's along the same lines, so another heterolytic cleavage mechanism, is after a hydrogen atom abstraction fragmentation, you can end up with a proton on your leaving group. And so I'll write this as RYH with a positive charge on Y. And in that case, again, you can take your electrons and your leaving group can leave. The third common mechanism that you'll see is a hydrogen atom abstraction. Fragmentation mechanism. And the point that I'll make here is that in addition to fragmenting, Radicals also have a propensity to pull off hydrogens to abstract atoms. It's one of the common reactions of radicals. If you've already studied, perhaps as an undergraduate, tributyl tin hydride chemistry, where you have maybe AIBN and an initiator to generate a free radical and a radical chain mechanism, and you use tributyl tin hydride, one of the key steps in your chain mechanism is going to be the radical plucking off a hydrogen. If you have a hydrogen in your molecule, the radical 
can pluck off the hydrogen. It's really quite indiscriminate about where it plucks it off. Remember, not only is it a free radical, but it's also a very hot free radical. And so it can, can go ahead and pluck off that hydrogen. It makes you feel like a, a freshman once again, where you have to keep track of, because you're seeing so many unfamiliar species, you have to keep track of your formal charges and keep track of your odd electrons. And so now we have a positive charge on Y, and this can undergo further fragmentation either by way of a homolytic cleavage over here. So I'll say homolytic or by way of a heterolytic cleavage over here. All right, in the abstract, this sounds very, very complicated. So what I'd like to do is to render it concrete. And I have a handout some transparencies. What? This, this is your homework. I'm helping you with, do you want me not to? Help you? Yeah. But if you want, we can just, we can just leave now. No? All right. What I'd, like, what I'd like to do is to convince you that these very few mechanisms I showed you actually account for all the peaks. So look. All right, so here, all right, the first thing you'll notice is that our compound has a molecular weight of 102, but our M plus is missing. This is not uncommon for alcohols. Then what you can think of is if you generate the radical cation, and you do a homolytic cleavage. So we have a methyl, a hydrogen, and a, a butyl group attached to the alpha carbon. If we cleave the hydrogen in a homolytic cleavage, and you'll often see people do an abbreviated mechanism where they just write one fish hook part and parcel with that, of course, is this odd electron comes in over here and we lose hydrogen. So if we do minus H dot, like so, then, and I tell you what, I will even be a good person and write in all my lone pairs of electrons to help you out. then that species is our species at 101. So here we see a tiny peak at 101. If I, in a very slavish fashion, simply repeat this process, And I'll just put the hydrogen down here, put my methyl over here. If I, in a very slavish fashion, repeat this process and lose a methyl dot, a methyl radical, 
now I have one, two, three, four, five, six, and I should have, whoops, what am I doing wrong here? One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. I lost, lost my hydrogen. Two, three. Did I add a carbon here? Take off one, two, three, four, five. Oops, I added, I added seven. So, easiest solution is just cut it off the end here. All right, so I lose, lose the methyl group and I end up with this species. Should have one, two, three, four, five. So that explains our peak at 87. It's loss of a methyl. That's 87 over there. If I do the same, and I'm going to skip the mechanism, but obviously if I just do minus butyl dot, that's going to take us to protonated acid aldehyde. And that's going to be our peak at 45. All right, so that actually takes care of three different key peaks in the spectrum. I'll show you one more pathway and that's our abstraction fragmentation pathway. So if I go ahead and again, I write our species and I'll just write it in a slightly different way just to make it, make it suggestive. So if I now, now write our species, the hydrogen, the oxygen can pluck off a hydrogen. So I'll draw a fish hook and a fish hook, and just for the sake of not having fish hooks fly everywhere, I won't draw a fish hook back to that carbon, but you can if you like. So I'll just draw the radical on that carbon. And now there are, there are a couple of ways that we can go. If, for example, water leaves, and at this point we have our heterolytic cleavage, water is leaving, taking its pair of electrons with it. So I'll just put my pair of electrons onto water. Like so. So we get a radical cation over here. That radical cation is going to be at 84. In fact, it's very common to see minus 17 for an alcohol, so that's a, a common cleavage pathway. And if I further go ahead and lose a methyl radical, and I'll, again I'll draw a single fish hook minus CH3 dot, now that's going to give rise to our, I think, the last species that we were supposed to see, which is our peak at So, go ahead. Um, can you not have that heterolytic cleavage where you just generate the, the O plus and that is leading? Where? 
the heterolytic cleave. Yeah. Okay, beautiful, beautiful question. So the question is, can we also have loss of OH dot? And the answer is you have a tiny amount over here, not enough to give a big peak. But you actually anticipated my next remark. And if we flip to the next spectrum, so the problem is that the OH radical is really, really unstable. You have to have an oct oxygen has an incomplete octet, and so that's bad. But the other thing that, um, that's bad about, about it is you get no hyperconjugative stabilization of the radical. Now, if we look at this ether here on the next plate page, then you can see this mechanism. And so I'll just use this as a chance to, to show this to you. So you also see a homolytic cleavage mechanism. I'll leave that to you to write on your own. And if we apply a heterolytic cleavage here, the leaving group takes its two electrons and leaves. So this radical, this oxygen-centered radical, is more stable than a hydroxy radical. So we lose 73. Our molecule was 130 to start with. We do see it. But now we get a carbocation here that either in a concerted fashion or a stepwise fashion almost certainly rearranges to the tert-butyl carbocation, which we see at 57. And so the answer is in the alcohol, you may have a little bit of it, but not enough to really see. In this case, we have even more, so we see it. In some cases, you'll see it directly with the alcohol. So I think, yeah, in the, in the alcohol, if you look, there's a teeny tiny peak at 85, and it's not clear whether it's big enough, whether it's the C13 isotope uh, or whether it, is, whether it is this. All right, I'll leave it to you. Uh, we'll talk about the next one in discussion section, but I want to finish up by talking about carbonyl compounds because we've gotten all but one key mechanism here. And the key mechanism for carbonyl chemistry so for carbonyl compounds, and that's the whole family, the aldehydes, ketones, etc., esters, amides, acids. The whole bloody family. You can think of this in a couple of ways. You have a homolytic cleavage pathway And in the homolytic cleavage pathway, it's the same as before. You picture taking your electron out of a lone pair. Reason is the lone pairs are the highest occupied molecular orbitals in the molecule. In a homolytic cleavage pathway, you break a bond like so. You lose R dot, you lose a radical. And you get an acillium ion. In many cases, so that'll cost you part of the molecule. In many cases, you'll see a further fragmentation where you now have a heterolytic cleavage. You lose carbon monoxide and you get 
I guess I've called this R prime, so I will stick with that. And you get R prime plus as a carbocation. The same chemistry that occurs here can occur in friedel craft solution phase chemistry. So for example, if I set out to do a friedel crafts acylation reaction with a compound that could easily fragment to give a tert-butyl alkyl carbocation, I might end up seeing friedel crafts alkylation competing with the friedel crafts acylation. In other words, loss of carbon monoxide from my acylium ion. In the gas phase where molecules are hot, it's even more prevalent. The other key reaction of carbonyl compounds is the McLafferty rearrangement. That's a charge accelerated retroene reaction. An ene reaction is a paracyclic reaction. It's very much akin to the Diels-Alder reaction. In the forward direction, it brings together an alkene component and a component with a double bond. In the reverse direction, you just push electrons in the opposite way. And I'll show you how I like to think of the McLafferty rearrangement. Sometimes you'll see it written with fish hooks. You'll see it written as a radical reaction. To me, this makes much more sense to think of it as a paracyclic reaction. So here I've written a alkyl chain hanging off of my radical cation. And if we simply move electrons in a ring in pairs in a six electron paracyclic process, much like you're going to learn in the Van Branken uh, class in 201 if you haven't already done so, now you can get a very nice, and I guess I'll call that R prime, you can get a very nice curved arrow mechanism. that kicks out an alkene. Take one, one moment to show you this pathway. So you will see in this compound, you will see examples of the homolytic cleavage, the homolytic cleavage with loss of carbon monoxide. I'll let you figure those all out, but I just want to show you the McLafferty pathway. Here we are at one, two, three, four, five, six. So two hexanone. And if I just write my McLafferty rearrangement like so, I lose propene. That's minus 42. We started with a weight of 100. And so let me just write my resulting product. And so we come to a peak at 58. And there we see our peak at 58. So as I said, you will also see all these other pathways we've talked about. You'll see the homolytic cleavage and further loss of CO. You'll see um, abstraction, fragmentation as well, and I'll let you figure all of that out on the homework. And I should point out on the preceding problem, on the amine problem, in addition to seeing the pathways um, that we've talked about, in addition to seeing, for example, the homolytic cleavage pathway, you will see a further retroene pathway giving rise to what actually is the strongest peak in the molecule. <laughs>
So we'll talk more about these on Monday. All right.